for joining us through the internet, welcome. Um, you can visit our website at PlymouthCongregational.org and you'll find all the up-to-date information, calendar, and also where you can um, donate if you wish. You're welcome to use our family worship room right outside the sanctuary. Service is broadcast from there. Okay, let's see what we have here. Thank you to those who are providing treats and just that is a family of Plymouth. If you don't have an opportunity to sign up for readers, readers, or flowers, please feel free to make some baked goods. We'll put them in the freezer for when we don't have anybody who's sponsoring that day. Thank you. The announcements are on the back of your bulletin. Bible class meets every Sunday at 9.30 before the service. It would meet the second and fourth Tuesday of the month at 2.30 here. The admin meeting and trustee meetings are there. Trustees is the first Thursday. The admin is the third Wednesday of each month. And the planning committee is the third Thursday of the month, which is also prayer meeting night. Um, also, our outing for the King County Cougars is June 14th. The ticket forms are on the Marathas and I think in the East Room. Please feel free to complete them. They're also on the website. Um, and you can send it to me, email it to me. If you have your payment, you can drop off here at church. If I'm not here, you can just put it in my box down the hallway there. The deadline is May 17th. It's a fireworks theme. And if you have young children, it's And some kind of <laughs> But it's going to be a lot of fun. Any other announcements? This Saturday is the just the lower open house. Uh, if you don't know what that is, we have the arms shop and town clothes, and we I have contracted with the instructors that taught there to come and teach different classes here at the church. We also will have open knitting uh, Wednesdays through Saturdays from 10 to 2. Please come and bring your projects and knit or crochet. Uh, there will be a website. I'm working on that right now. Uh, it's called bestitches-door123.com. That will show you all the classes from beginning to advanced. Uh, there is a charge for the classes, uh, and plus you would have to buy your supplies. Uh, but part of the amount that is being charged for the classes comes back to the church. So please come Saturday and support us to come and see what we've got in store for you. It's going to be an amazing Saturday, and this looks like the weather's going to be pretty good for that and miss them. Thank you, Stella, for taking care of that. Appreciate it. Also, a reminder, mark your calendars. Saturday, May 18th is work day here at the church. We'll be putting out a list probably next Sunday or Sunday after that. Hopefully next Saturday. We have a meeting this Thursday, so we'll put it together. And it'll be out here so you'll know what we need to do. Are there any other announcements? All righty, seeing none. Our scripture reading today is 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 50 through 58. I declare to you, brothers and sisters, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the perishable. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of nine, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable, and the mortal with the mortal immortality. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable, the mortal with the immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through the Lord our through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters.
sisters stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. If you'll open your hymns, I turn to page 239. Our opening hymn is, I know that my Redeemer lives. Jesus said to us, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. I want to ask you all here today a question. How do you know? How do you know that God loves you? Anybody want to share that? How do you know that? Do you know? What makes you know that? I'm sorry? The things he does for us. The things he does for us. We look at those things and we see that if, if you stop and, and think about the times that you could have been involved in an accident, times that you could have been on an operating table and not making. We look at those things and we see how God loves us. But then we look at other situations of other people and we say, how? How come God didn't do something great there? Have you ever felt that way? I have. We, we've just experienced some things uh, you all know that Stella's nephew died last week, and we're calling there trying to find out what's going on, and they're not even having anything at all, nothing. No service, no closure. No and I've talked to so many people this week that they don't even know that God loves them. They've heard John 3.16. 
15, we can all quote that, can we not? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That, that's a, a verse in the scripture that we look at and we go, see, God loves me, he gave me his son. We just celebrated uh, Resurrection Sunday. And resurrection, I don't know if you realize this or not, but resurrection was the capstone of Jesus' life. Had he stayed in the grave, we would be worshiping a dead God. All the other religious leaders of the world, I can take you to their grave and it says, here lies. But that grave is empty. How do you know God loves you? I know God loves me because there are a thousand things you could put in there. Thank you, Judy. Because of the things he does for us. And some of you say, I don't think God loves me because of the things he doesn't do for me. Have you ever felt that way? I have. When, when you get in the point in your life where you're expecting God to do things, and, and I've lived there now for almost 50 years, that I expect God to do things. I expect him to close my mouth when it should be closed. And many times that doesn't happen. You know why? Because he expects me to shut it when it should be closed. How many of you have been in that situation where you let your mouth overload what your feet can deliver? Guilty. I'm guilty as sin. It reminds me of a court case that I was involved in. I ran a stop sign. Actually, I turned right on red. And the sign that I didn't see was as big as this wall right here. And a police officer says, you couldn't see that sign? It was as big as your truck. Well, God, if you love me, why did you let me get a ticket? Have you ever felt that? Sure you have. Every last one of us has felt these things. But how do we know beyond a shadow of a doubt that God loves us. Maybe I ought to ask the other question. Do you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that God loves you? Every one of us sitting in this room has had one of our loved ones die. We've had someone come down with terrible disease. We've, we've missed all those things. We, we question. God doesn't get upset with you if you question. God doesn't get mad at you if you go, why did you do this? God gets upset with us when we pray those itty-bitty prayers that we can take care of ourselves. You know? It's sort of like the snow yesterday. <laughs> the whole time I'm, I'm standing waiting to on the wedding at Pilcher Park and I'm standing there and it's raining like cats and dogs and it's snowing to beat the band and I'm thinking to myself God what are you doing? <coughs> standing in the middle of the greenhouse doing this wedding I get this water dripping. So I did one of these. And now it's going. <laughs> so I did one of these. The bride's off center, so I, I scooted up. I said, Nicole, if you just move over a little. She says, I'm trying to stay out of the water. <laughs> God has a sense of humor, doesn't he? He has to. Look who he has as your pastor. When Jesus tells us to love the Lord thy God with all your heart, mind, soul, and body, that's not a suggestion. The scripture tells us that 
we love him because he first loved us, right? When we look at the fact that he first loved us, we look around and we see, okay, right now, in this very moment, we look around here and say, God, if you love us so much, why don't you fill the pew? The scripture says, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. <coughs> now, I don't know if you realize this or not, but God didn't say big was better. One of the things that I truly love is the fact that if y'all have a question during my sermon, I hope you have enough guts to ask me, what do you mean by that? Okay. Have you ever heard of a king named Josiah. You ever heard of a king named Josiah? You know who he was? He was the youngest king to ever rule Israel. You know how old he was? Eight years old. Now there will be a test after this. <laughs> Why was he the most successful Can I tell you why? If you read about it, he loved God, yes. But you know one of the things he did that we need to do today? He went through all of Israel and found every idol that was ever established, ever put up, and tore it down. And he also had wise, older advisors. And you know what they suggested for him to do? They suggested for him to do what the scripture says. Love the Lord thy God with all your heart, mind, soul, and body. And then he says, know the scriptures. Know the scriptures. You see, one of the things I want you to know is the Bible says in Revelation chapter 3, verse 16. Revelation 3, verse 16. So because you are, now, this doesn't apply to anybody in this room today. But listen, because you are lukewarm, neither hot or cold, I'm about to spit you out right now. I wish you were either one or the other. Now, I've taken a different look at that recently. If you were hot for the Lord... How do you make tea and coffee? You make it with hot water, don't you? But how do you make iced tea? What does, what's the difference between cold and hot water? The temperature. The temperature. But I want you to understand something here. The temperature is dependent upon what it's being used for. How many of you in the summertime drink hot coffee other than me? Hot coffee, hot tea, I love it. But generally we drink iced tea or ice, ice water, right, to cool us down. Or we get Coke with ice in it, and I won't mention what Bill puts in his. But we have those things to either warm us or cool us. So I look at this hot or cold a little differently here. He didn't say he was going to spew the cold water out. He didn't say he was going to spew the hot water out. He said he was going to spit that tepid water out. My, my mother was a great uh, physician in her own right. She would take a little bit of warm water, put some paregoric sugar in it, stir it up and give it to me if I had an earache. Now, I don't know about you, but if I could get that same elixir today, I'd go to jail. Did you know that? Did you know what paragoric is? You don't? Does anybody know what it is? Yep. What is it? It uh, kills pain. It kills pain. <laughs> it's actually liquid <coughs> heroin. <laughs> That's what it really is. But here, I want you to understand something. 
Now you know what's wrong with me? Here's, here's what I want you to see. Okay? Here's what I want you to see. God uses absolutely everybody and everything. I want you to know that God loves you. I want you to know that beyond the shadow of a doubt. How can I help you do that today? How can I help you do that? Well, the Bible tells us. That's where we find our answers, is it not? In the Bible? We find that Jesus says, by this will all men know that you're my disciples if you have love one for another. Not if you have CBD in a bottle and everybody can borrow some of it. That's where it's going to be before long. Not that you have a better idol than someone else. God says, by this will all men know that you're my disciples if you have love one for another. What does it say in 1 Corinthians chapter 13? You all know that verse, that chapter real well. We call it the love chapter. Don't we? What is the love chapter? The love chapter says love is patient and kind. Don't you ask her if I'm patient. of you understand that we are not perfect. We are not perfect. Does God expect us to be perfect? Anybody? No. Oh, then what's Jesus say when he says, be ye perfect even as your Father in heaven is perfect? He knows we can't do it without him. So therefore, God has demonstrated his love for us in that while we were still sinners, he paid the price of our redemption. I, I determined that I'm going to stop using the word sinner because it offends people. You think I'm going to do that? But let me explain the word redemption. The word redemption is this. Something had to be paid for me. I go back to my wonderful illustration of the S&H green stamps. How many of you still have cuts on your tongue from licking them and sticking them in the books? How many of you still have back problems from carrying all those books in so you could get a little clock radio to take home? How many of you have the hope of heaven because someone redeemed you at a place called Calvary or Golgotha upon a rugged old cross and spent his life for you? If that is not love, then there is no such thing as love. It all boils down to another four-letter word called lust. What King Josiah did was decided that he would do what the Ten Commandments declared. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. We will have no graven images. How many of you can tell me exactly what Jesus looks like? Anybody? Do we have any statues of Jesus? Do we have any pictures of Jesus? Do we have, we have Salzman's picture. You all know what that one is, don't you? That's the wonderful long-haired picture of Jesus. We have, what's his face is, is it painted it in the 60s, He's a short-haired Jesus. We've got all kinds of artist conceptions of him, but we don't know what color his skin was or his hair was or his eyes were. Why? Why? Because we can look at one another and see the love of God in each other. I had <clears throat> the wedding rehearsal I had last week. 
on Saturday. The maid of honor was a little tipsy, to say the least. And she said, you don't love me, do you? I said, oh, yes, I do. I love you with the love of the Lord. She says, oh, my God, you think I'm a sinner. I said, no, I don't think you're a sinner. I think you're a sinner like the rest of us. She came to the wedding so because I threatened But I cared enough for the bride and the wedding that we were doing to tell her if she showed up that way, I wouldn't let her in the wedding. And she was a maid of honor. Have you ever had love be very, very stern? Our youngest daughter's in from Minneapolis. <laughs> and, and, and it's kind of funny talking to her. She said to me last night, I said, Deb, what do you need? She says, all I need is to be loved. If I were to ask you all today, what do you need? What's the first biggest need in your life? Besides a million dollars, besides a new car, besides you know, all the things that are in life, what's the biggest need you have? And it's to be loved. It's to be loved. We love him because he first loved us. How do we know he first loved us? Well, if you go to the temple... Look at the pictures of the temple, Solomon's temple. And as you walk in the door, you see the demonstration of God's love there. You see the brazen altar where all the sacrifice takes place. And there upon that altar, all the sacrifice for sin was done. You say, well, that doesn't seem like much love. Well, go with me then, back a little further to a place called Egypt. And remember a thing called the Exodus. And the night that Israel was getting ready to leave Egypt, God told them to do something. Does anybody remember what he told them to do? Put blood of what? of a sacrificial lamb on the doorpost and the lintel. And what then did God say? When I see the blood, I will pass over. The demonstration of God's love is in the blood that was shed. You say, that doesn't sound very loving to me. What isn't very loving is when we put any other God before him, any other God, whether it's a family member, whether it's the Cubs, or the Bears, or the White Sox, or the Los Angeles Dodgers. Actually, that should be called the Brooklyn Dodgers from my era. You understand, we establish so many of these things in our lives. And all of them kind of take from God. And we're willing to give to God an hour, an hour and a half on Sunday. Maybe sometime during the week. And then what God asked of us, when he asked us something, we said, oh, I, 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 I'm, I'm sorry. I'm too busy. Oh, I, I, I'm sorry. What would it have been like on that day that Jesus was arrested that he says, I'm sorry, take him. You don't have to go in the house. Amen, sister. Amen. You want to come preach a while? But you see, what would have happened was the price, the price of our salvation would have not been do you understand at that brazen altar when Bob 
offerings were sacrificed. It had to be a lamb of the first year without spot or blemish. In other words, it had to be the one that you were going to use for next year to brood, to breed the ones that were going to be the prime people in your uh, sheep and your pasture. But he's supposed to bring that to the altar. And when, when that lamb is slain, slain, he has to put his hand on it so he can feel the life coming. That's, that's called his love for his family. That's why the father went every year to the temple with a sacrifice to pay the price. Now, the sacrifice, the price has been paid for us, every one of us. But just like the children of Israel, on the night of Passover, that's why they call it Passover. On the night of Passover, do you think there were some well-meaning Israelites that said, oh, he won't hurt us. We're his favorite people. Pharaoh's firstborn was killed. Firstborn of every livestock was killed. The firstborn of any place or anybody that was not within the covering of the blood was slain. Why? Why would a loving God do that? Why would a loving God let our nephew die? Why would a loving God let Mike die? Why would a loving God have any of the people that we love die? He loves us, right? You're trying to convince us of that love. Can I tell you why? You may not like the answer. But it's because of his mercy and love that he does take some people sometimes out of where they are. Sometimes we can't understand. But we have to believe this word. For God so loved the world. his son Jesus Christ he didn't give us life through some sheep or goat or lamb he gave us life through his son so that we might in retrospect turn to him and say thank you that I don't have to spend eternity away from you how do I know God loves me this book tells me so. And you know what I've done? I've chosen to believe this book. Have you chosen to believe this book? Have you chosen to believe every line, every jot and tittle in it? Have you chosen to believe that God says, I love you with an everlasting love? If you read Psalm 136, it says his mercy is everlasting. It could be translated his love is everlasting. His love never fails. His love never stops. We read 1 Corinthians 13, and it says love never fails. You say, yeah, but you did fail. Your mom died. Your dad died. This one died. That one died. They all died. And it tells us in the scripture that it is appointed to man once to die. Is there anybody here that thinks you're going to change that? I see Linda sitting there and I, I think about Ada sitting next to her and I think about him. I look around this room and I see people who've had loved ones die. And this preacher has enough guts to stand in front of you and say that God has a plan? He does. But do I understand it all the way? No. I understand one thing. There's a song. 
that is absolutely imperative that we understand. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. I know what Jacob's going through with her mom. It's not pretty. It's not pleasant. But the key word there is going through. Those of us who've lost loved ones, I've had people say, Rodney, ah, you'll get over it. No, you never get over that. And one thing I want to tell you that I'll never, ever, never, ever, ever, never get over is the fact that a loving, creative God loves little old me. I don't know about you. I don't know if that thrills you or not. But it really makes me feel great because I know I can't deserve what he's given. I don't deserve it her, let alone the children that we have or the love that I have experienced from them. I don't, ex- I don't deserve any of that, but what I do deserve for all of sin we come short of the glory of God. You think God doesn't love you? Especially during the hard time? Think about what it would be like if he did not love you. Think about how hard it would be. I'll say to you what I say to a lot of folks. Lay up for yourselves treasure. tells us in Hebrews that uh, we're surrounded by a great cloud of witness. I'll, sh- I'll share that scripture with you. And, and what I did, what I did in, in, the, in the way I love this scripture is this here. Okay, It says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles us. Let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him, what was set before him? All of heaven, all of the creation of God, he's God. He had it all. Yet for the joy set before him, it says, he endured the cross. Scorning his shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God, consider him who endured such opposition from sinful, so that from sinful, so that you might grow weary and love and lose heart. He did that so we would not grow weary. any sense so that we would not lose hope for the hope set before us is in Jesus it's not in our bank account or our cars or our homes it's in Jesus we love him because he first Loved us. Consider him who endured such opposition from sin, from the sinful, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Would you pray with me, please? 
Father, I ask you to take this, make this seed within us. And God, we would really begin to recognize your love. Yes, by the things that you do. And also by the things that you keep us from doing. And Lord, that we look to you who loved us so greatly that you set aside all of the glories of heaven and came in sinful flesh to live without sin and then the just for the unjust so that we could declare and claim ourselves righteous
usual, flew us in. The woman was surprised. You're a Jew, she said to Jesus. And I'm a Samaritan. Jews will never take anything from Samaritans. You don't know who I am, Jesus said to her. If you did, you would ask me for water that gives life. Sir, the woman said, you don't even have a bucket. Where are you going to get this living water?
something special about praying together in the unity of faith, believing not only that you hear us, but that it's your choice and your desire to answer our prayer. So, Father, we lift these to you in the mighty name of Jesus. And everyone said, Amen. Let's uh, turn to page 29 and 30. Let's stand again.
but through our, throughout this week that we may show our worship in the things that we do for others, that they may know the love.